This morning's message is easy to grasp in understanding, but to apply it to our lives, that's always a different matter. In the meantime, how many of you have had the proposition of uh, to grow up? Either you made that proposition to someone else or someone has said it to you. It's not always easy to accept and sometimes our feelings get a little turned or maybe it does a little reflection um, when people say grow up to us. And it's easy for us to say grow up to other people uh, if we can see that maybe they're acting immature or they're not doing what they should be doing. Um, there was an incident at work for many who have known the Lord has promoted me at my workplace and I thank God for that but not even within a week when the manager broke it to the other two employees we have four people in our department I noticed right away that um, the one man his countenance kind of dropped as soon as he said well Rob is going to be doing such and such and I try to make known to him that just because you have a title, I'm not the type of person to have that go to my head. And as believers, I don't think that should be the case no matter where or what position we have. Um, I made known to him that I don't think I'm a different person than you, but my responsibilities of what I have to do change. So um, he, of course, started saying things like, well, we don't need two bosses, and uh, you know, well, the decision's already been made, and. He was kind of just not really too happy about it, but it was immature. And not within a week later, I was <clears throat> emailing both of my other employees, <clears throat> telling them uh, certain things that we have to do, something we have to focus on. And then he comes up to me about the email and starts giving me grief. You know, I know what I'm doing. Y'all need to tell me what I'm doing. And obviously, he misunderstood the email. So the other employee walked up, so he kind of was quiet. And I went over to the other building to, to try to help ease the misunderstanding by writing another email. As I was writing the other email, I'm thinking to myself, well, what, what's going to be that where he would probably take this the wrong way as well? So I prayed to the Lord, uh, Lord, help me to let this in your hands. As soon as I was just praying that, he walks into the office and shuts the door and goes at it again. So I said, Lord, help me to uh, let your name be glorified because you put me in this position. So I let him just say what he had to say. And um, a couple things that he said made me, tempted me just to say, grow up. You know, you have a job, be thankful, stop giving me grief. But I said, if I would do that, then who's acting mature? as a believer, as one who is faithfully representing God. So I said, Lord, keep the door on my lips and uh, just let you uh, say what needs to be said. And I pretty much said grow up in a sense that wasn't directly towards that, towards that degree. I stated the very facts of what he was doing. He hasn't been working there not even a year. Um, about 75 to 80 percent of his workload was cut off to him. And uh, he's gotten hours that were changed to good hours. So I made that known to him. And uh, I just told him, I'm just trying to do my job. I have certain responsibilities now, and I'm just doing what I have to do. Uh, I don't think it's right that, you know, what you're doing is appropriate and helping me to fulfill my, my duties. So he kind of, you know, shook his head, yeah, I understand. And uh, we left it at that because that was the end of the day, and I had to leave. And I left it in the Lord's hand at that point, and uh, the following Monday, I'm walking in the department, and he's, and, he's, and he's walking towards me, and I said, Lord, help me. <laughs> uh, you know, and I always do that from now on. Like, there's people who come up, they ask you questions. You never know what they're going to ask. And I always just send up a simple prayer. Lord, help me to respond and say what you would have me to say, period, because you never know. So he comes up to me, and he shakes my hand, and he says, sorry for the way I've been treating you. And, uh, you know, I know I've been acting, you know, not the way I should be acting. And I'm just like, um, it's okay, you know, I, there's no hard feelings. But God, God's always working, and it just shows, you know, that he is able to speak to people's hearts in different ways and in different manners. And um, even though, and my other co-worker, he's my age, and he's into, like, comics and 
he doesn't have his license yet, and he's it's just in that essence he needs to grow up as well. But he's he's a 35 year old stuck in a 16 year old mindset. So, but um, we see that you know the one was acting mature on how he handles things at work. Uh, the other one, of course, is just not mature. <laughs> We see things that we can say, well, you, know, you need to grow up. You, know, you see, you can discern that you, know, you need to grow up. But how is it with me? How is it with you? As a person who believes in God, does God make this proposition to us to grow up? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to be reading verses 11 through 14. Before we read um, verses, uh, you know, I encourage you to read 1 through 10. 1 through 10 is speaking about the high priest, you know, about Aaron, of course, about Jesus, and Melchizedek. And um, that's a good study all on its own. And Melchizedek, just to briefly summarize verses 1 through 10, Melchizedek was first, of course, mentioned in Genesis, and uh, he was the king of Salem, and Salem meaning peace. In Hebrews, uh, Melchizedek is uh, translated as king of righteousness. So, Melchizedek is a, a, a picture of king of peace and king of righteousness. And it summarizes and illustrates that Christ, of course, is our king of peace and king of righteousness. And um, as he's kind of referenced that, it kind of transitions verses 11 through 14, these last verses. Speaking of whom, about Christ, you know, and the, he is our high priest now of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belong to them that are full of age, even those who are by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So the author here, of course, is God, you know, through, I, I believe it was Paul, um, is saying, uh, we have many things to say, many things to expound, many things to go forward on. However, you have become dull in your hearing, you have become stagnant in your learning, and you become babes again, and you need the very first principles of God to be taught to you again, which is pretty sad, and it's sobering even to our own walk in life. Sometimes we go through certain things, and we say, okay, I get that, I understand. I went through prophecy meetings, I've, I've studied the word, I've studied certain principles, and we kind of take a, a lounge seat and say, I've done that, been there, I don't need to uh, you know, go through that again. And that happens, that happens to all of us at times. And um, it's very dangerous because God's word is not a natural book. You know, we, we've learned, we learn more and more as we go through it from time and time again. And uh, I just wanted to kind of read another version. And I thought it was pretty, pretty interesting. Same verse, uh, verses, chapter 5, 11 through 14. This is the amplified version. It's pretty interesting. Concerning this, we have much to say, which is hard to explain, since you have become dull in your spiritual hearing and sluggish, even slothful, in achieving spiritual insight. For even though by this time you ought to be teaching others, you actually need someone to teach you over again the first principles of God's word. You have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who continues to feed on milk is obviously inexperienced, and unskilled in the doctrine of righteousness, of conformity to the divine will and purpose, thought and action, 
for he is a mere infant, not even able to talk yet. But solid food is for full-grown men, for those whose senses are and mental faculties are trained by practice to distinguish between what is morally good and noble and what is evil and contrary either, either to human or divine law. So it's pretty much saying you ought to be teaching others and now what we have to be teaching you again, over again. And it, it, it's sad, but uh, it's kind of silly too. Like if we would say, okay, after Sabbath school, you know, those who are visiting, you know, let's go back into the fellowship hall and we have serving a meal of applesauce and, and bottled milk. It seems silly, but like there's nothing wrong with applesauce. But uh, it's not solid food. I like applesauce, but it's not solid food, and it just seems silly that we're all sitting and fellowshipping, and then we have a visitor, and he sees us, we're all eating applesauce and bottled milk. It, it looks foolish, but in a sense, it's pretty much saying the same thing. We're not at that stage anymore. We, need, we're, 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 we should be eating solid food. Now, if someone has a baby, that's fine, because they are in that stage. A good little illustration was... Um, a group of tourists were visiting a, a village, a beautiful village, a picturesque village where you can just kind of put out a canvas and start painting because it was so beautiful. And the tourists were walking and uh, they see a local uh, old man. He's sitting by the fence and uh, they, wanted, they were going to ask him a question. They were patronizing and they said, uh, have any great men have been born in this village? And the old man replied, nope, only babies. So the did it, did it click? <laughs> it's, it seems funny, but it's true. You know, we're all born as a baby, you know, and uh, you're not born a great man. And uh, growing up in the Lord is where we want to grow up in. And uh, we're not great men and women without growing in him. And every person who was born again, a born again believer, starts out as a babe in Christ. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. You start there. So whether a new convert is seven or 70, he's still a babe in Christ. He's a baby Christian. However, it's sad if the baby Christian is still a baby Christian after five, 10, 20 years go by. God intends for us to grow. He intends for us to grow so that we can be a positive influence on the lives of others, so that we can disciple others and ultimately bear God's true character among the world. Until we desire or want to learn to dig into God's word, to get the meat of his word, we will never grow. That's just, it's just, it's just plain as day. And I emphasize this because, I mean, I praise God I'm not the man that I used to be, but God wants me to be more so than I am today. And we are all learning. We're all at our different stages. But I should not be at the same spot that I was five, one year ago, you know, a couple weeks ago. You should be growing in your, in your walk with the Lord. We shouldn't get stagnant. We should want to desire to know God's word. And many people say, well, you know, some things are hard to understand in the Bible. And they are, but that, what are you trying to say? You just don't read it, don't continue to, to, to want to know what he has to say, because that's not going to help you understand if you just give up. And uh, there was a good quote by Mark Twain. He said, the things in the Bible that trouble me are not the things that I don't understand, but the things that I do. Because you're more accountable for what you do know. And I think one of the reasons why we don't understand more is because maybe we may not be walking in the light that God has shown us. No one can say, I don't understand anything in the Bible. So the things that you do understand, that's where you start. Are you applying and walking in the light that you do know that you have now? If you're not, why would God send you more light and understanding if you're not walking in the one you have now? <clears throat> so growing up in Christ is learning from his word. Some people will say, I don't know if you ever heard it, as long as you have the Holy Spirit, you have love, and you believe in Jesus, everything's fine. You don't need to learn every little detail of doctrine in the Bible. And that's been said to me before as well when you get into some deep subjects. Now, I agree you do need love, and you do need 
to believe in Jesus and have the Holy Spirit. However, the Holy Spirit is going to give you understanding of what the Word says, of what God's love is trying to tell us, and of Jesus. Of course, Jesus said, search the Scriptures, and then you think you have eternal life. Those are the things which testify of me. So, in a sense, they're right, but they're somewhat given an excuse not to grow more deeply in the Word of God. Um, we cannot expect to grow up properly in our spiritual growth without the Spirit along with the Word. <clears throat> and some people may get a little timid, I myself at times, uh, to give an answer. Sometimes people will question things about the Bible. Um, we actually should be learning and then praying for opportunities that people do ask you questions. However, how am I ever going to give an answer um, if I never gain understanding of which to give an answer. So you don't have to go here, but you can write these verses down. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. I will just, we'll, we'll go there. Yeah. The Bible says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you of the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. If you have a hope, if you have an understanding of that hope which is in the word of God, the Bible says you have to be ready always to give an answer. There was a man at work who... Um, about four or five years ago, we were in discussion about, uh, I don't know how, sometimes it's weird how when you're talking about spiritual things, it leads to one thing and it leads to another. And I was pretty much saying it's, it's a shame where God makes a distinction on certain things and mere man doesn't make a distinction. And I think we were talking about, you know, the church in Israel. And then I, I said, of course, where, where God does make a distinction, clean and unclean, and as far as eating of us certain foods, you know, Mere man then doesn't do that as well. And then he brought up war about Acts 7, about Peter's vision. You know, God says, you know, he calls everything clean. And uh, I let him say what he had to say. And I said, I just encouraged him to go back and read the entire chapter of Acts 10 and read verses 24, or no, 28 and verse 34. And that is the context where Peter was having a trouble because he was kind of distancing himself from the Gentile. And I said, God was just giving a beautiful illustration or an object lesson to Peter about what he knew was clean and unclean. He was doing the same thing to people or to the Gentiles. So he said, you know, okay. So he, I didn't think he would do it. I just encouraged him, and we left it at that. We had to get back to work. I'm not sure if it was the very next day, but uh, it was the next time I saw him. He came up to me, and, and he, he, he's a Christian, too, and he was, he was uh, he's, he's a faithful believer as far as I see. He's walking the light that he has. He's always sharing, you know, Jesus um, within the work when he can. So I commend him for that. He, he came up to me and thanked me. He says, that is a beautiful illustration. You know, so he, he understood the whole concept of what God was trying to tell Peter. It wasn't about food necessarily. It was about what Peter was doing to the, how he was treating the Gentile uh, on spreading the gospel. Did that change him on how he was going to eat certain things? I don't know. But he knew about the whole judging people uh, according to sharing the gospel. But how would I have known what to say at that time if I would not have studied it for myself? So I praise God for giving me that desire and giving me that understanding so when that time came, you could share that. And it's okay. There's sometimes we're going to say, I don't know, I don't understand. It's okay. But that's an opportunity where you're challenged then to go and look what does the Bible say. Another time was uh, the same man who was giving me grief uh, recently about the promotion. And these are, these are all good people. I mean, today, at this point, I praise God that the person I work with now totally changed the character, totally changed as far as how he was acting before. So I pray, praise God for that. He uh, was wondering why. He couldn't understand. He has a friend who was his age, in his 50s, who has, he was pretty much given terminal cancer and he has two years to live. 
And he said he didn't understand his friend on his decision to continue to work until he dies. And uh, he knows my position. He knows I'm a believer. So I kind of, the Lord gave me a way to just kind of make it so where he would be open to hear what I had to say. And I said, you know, I said, Dan, you, you know my position. And uh, you said you didn't understand. But I said, we're, whether it's two years or 20 years, we're, you're, you or I are going to be working until, until we die anyway. So what would be the difference? I said, I don't know your friend's position, but... I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ where there is hope. I said, this is not my life here. This is not the end of it. This is not what it's all about. I come to work and I have motivation because I know this is not my home. And I said, whether I have 10 or 20 years or two years um, to live, if you have hope, it makes all the difference. And uh, he kind of, you know, shook his head. He understood that, and, uh, which I thank the Lord for that. And uh, it's a shame because, you know, cancer, it's like the common cold now. I remember when there was a time where I used to hear of a person who had a person who had cancer. I can count five people who I'm talking, like I'm talking to you in my workplace, five people that died of cancer. One person was 10 years younger than me. And uh, it's just like, these things happen, but it gives opportunity to, to wake people up. Hopefully when they're diagnosed or hopefully when that happens that they know that person. Um, we all have a cancer inside of us and it's sin. How are we going to treat it? And uh, there's actually now two people earlier this week. Well, there was one person back in November. Both husband and wife worked at the company I work at. The wife was let go of work. She was depressed, whatnot. And I, I knew, I talked to her, Linda, so, so often, and P, her husband. I've given tracks before. We used to converse a lot about spiritual things. And uh, one day, Pete came home from work and uh, found his wife uh, committed suicide. And uh, of course, it's hard for him uh, um, to go through that. Um, People, it was, of course, out of sheer desperation, thinking that there's no hope or that you're hopeless. And we all get depressed and discouraged at times, but that's what the reality is. When you look in the Word of God, when you grow in the Word of God, it's not just to learn particular doctrines, but this should give a clearer picture of Jesus, who is our hope. There is hope in learning and growing in God's Word. And uh, earlier this week, there, um, the downstairs office, um, that, that's the kind of section I take care of. And uh, Cindy, who works there, and her brother Eddie, who works on the other building, there's three buildings, they work at the company as well. So it's kind of family oriented. There's a lot of you know, connections there. People were sad, I think it was Tuesday, and, uh, in the downstairs office. So it, it kind of seemed there's something wrong, and I asked one of the persons, and she says, you know Cindy? I said, oh, yeah, I know Cindy, yeah. Her husband just committed suicide. And that was Monday night. He's 46 years old. Left behind a daughter who was finishing her high school and a son who was starting college. It's sad. I mean, what do you... You'd be there. The funeral was, of course, Thursday. It was packed, and... Uh, it's very sad that people who know who knew him, he just had a change. He just lost all hope. He got let go of his work, and there was other issues. He thought he was a burden because he couldn't find work. And I mean, to me, in my sense, I I, I think it's selfish to do that because you leave people behind. Um, I'm not judging the person. I don't know what he was exactly going through, but it opened up opportunity because other people came to me and asked questions. Uh, one person, another Cindy, who I've talked to many times on spiritual things, came up to and said, uh, what does the Bible say about cremation? And, that, and then I didn't know where, why it was said. Maybe I guess the person who got cremated. 
And I, you know, I gave her, you know, that the Bible doesn't say too much about cremation, but I said, because she mentioned ashes to ashes, I said, it's just a quicker process, you know. So it's, she asked if it was a sin. I didn't say, I don't think the Bible condemns cremation. Um, but as far as the next question, she says, well, what does the Bible say about suicide? And I said, God alone knows the heart. And I said, he's going to deal with what is needed, and you can count on his judgment. I said, but there is an instance about one who was counted among the faithful, and I said, you can read that yourself in Hebrews chapter 11, and that was Samson. He committed suicide, and, but he is counted among the faithful. He will be saved. When things like these happen, it opens up conversation, and we were talking for a while, and I said, the people's mindset for, to do that, I don't, I don't know how they can get to that point where they would do that, knowing they have a family, knowing they have other people, to get to that point. I mean, he left a note. He said he was, and actually the brother, Shane, the brother, brother-in-law, Eddie, he's the one that found him. So I could, when I first got to the funeral, I saw that he was shaken up because you, you can imagine. That's gonna be uh, traumatizing for anyone. But uh, <clears throat> I told Cindy, the other person who asked me about cremation and, and, and uh, is it a sin, of course, to commit suicide. I said, I think the reasons why people get to that point is because they believe that there is no hope. It's hopeless. And I told her, I said, as long as there is life, there is hope. How do you know? If there's one more day, he could have waited patiently and the Lord could have done something. And I just believe it's a tragedy. And you, have, you hear it happen to more and more, the suicide rates. It's, it's a shame. But it's true, as long as there is life, there is hope. And there is hope and comfort in the scriptures. When you grow in the Lord, if you're stagnant, you're going to get dis discouraged, you're going to get depressed, and you're not going to grow in the Lord. It's just, it's clear as that. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 15, verse 4, I think is a powerful verse. Romans 15, 4. <clears throat> for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So growing, the things that are written for us are for our learning and for our hope and comfort. And I believe it's very important that we do not get to a point where we think, okay, I understand the Sabbath, the state of the dead, you know, all these various things which are important, but we, we must grow. Um, as Carl has mentioned also, the verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2, study to show yourself approved unto God. We're not here to be approved of men or the church or, or anyone else or other people that you, you might know certain things because we also have to make reference that even though you might know a lot, you might be learning in the scriptures, it's not just about intellect. God wants us to understand it, yes, but he wants it to reach the heart. A lot of times we, we, it's a shame people have understanding of the truth about certain things, but it's just in here. And they, they try to share the truth but they do it with the wrong spirit. And that's actually more detrimental. That's why in the scripture reading, of course, it says speaking the, the truth in love. And that's only going to happen if the truth is settled into your heart. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And it says may grow up into him. Um, show, study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When the Lord comes, there's no excuses. We can't say, well, I didn't know that. Well, did you have opportunity to know that? So um, it's very important to continue to be in God's word because it will change your whole life. It's done mine, and I'm still learning many things. And there's many things I need to learn. And we're all at our certain spots in life. And no one is greater because they know this more than you. They just started before you. 
However, we can't stay where we're at. We need to grow. And not only grow, but people may think the gospel is Jesus Christ who's come to die for our sins. And that is the gospel. That is the main theme. However, it might sound a little heretic, but if I were to say and that there's more to the cross of Christ, and I'm going to continue if we go back to Hebrews chapter 11. We read 11 through 14. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6, 1 to 3. See, the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel about him dying for our sins, that is the foundation. However, even God has said that we need to grow, not throw those things away, but put them where they need to be. That's the foundation that we need to grow upon. Here in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 to 3, it says, um, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of the doctrines of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. He's pretty much saying, you know, these were the foundations. Don't throw them away, and we will bring them up if we need to, but we need to grow upon them. It doesn't make any sense if I, I build a house on the right foundation, the foundation is laid, and I have a couple friends who are helping me, and they go away for about a year or two, and they come back to see my progress, and it's still the foundation. And that's pretty much what it's kind of saying. You, you don't build a foundation, you leave it there. You need to grow upon that. Uh, in that same uh, Amplified version, I thought it was pretty interesting how they, they rendered... 6, 1 to 3. Therefore, let us go on and get past the elementary stage in the teachings and the doctrine of Christ, the Messiah, advancing steadily toward the completeness and perfection that belong to spiritual maturity. Let us not again be laying the foundation of repentance and of aband abandonment of dead works, dead formalism, and of faith by which you turn to God. <clears throat> resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment and punishment, these are all matters of which you should have been fully aware of long ago. If indeed God permits, we will now proceed to advance learning. So these are all wonderful things, but we need to be, continue to grow into the Lord. And I just want to commend and thank God that we have uh, people within the church that are, are, are doing that. They're they're feeding the flock, as Jesus said to Peter, you know, feed my lambs. And I, and I praise God, I guess, you know, the Kims are not here today, but David, I don't know if you're aware of a while ago, you know, he stu stuck out in faith and presented the Firm Foundation Bible Studies. And I praise God for Carl being used and, and doing these revival series. And I want to thank everyone who is in the position of Sabbath school teaching, the cradle role, you know, primary, uh, young disciple, the adult Sabbath school. Let's continue to do that. We need to teach one another, edify one another, and be desirous and sincere in growing, the Lord, growing in the Lord and growing in his word. I'm not sure if you ever heard of Pablo Casals, but the question is, are we continually growing? Pablo Casals, I'm not sure if I'm even pronouncing it right, but he was considered the greatest cellist who ever lived. When he was 95 years old, he asked, why he continued to practice six hours a day. He answered, because I think I'm making progress. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but if I was 95 years old, I'd be glad and thankful if I stayed awake for six hours a day. <laughs> but uh, practicing six hours, wow, that's... But it, it just gives us encouragement that he was sincere and he was de dedicated in his you know, his talent, his you know, being a cellist. How, how are we? Are we continuing growing? How are we treating the Word of God? 
Are we sincere? Are we really growing? Or do, or do we say, okay, I'm old, I'm, I'm retired, I don't need to, I've learned that already, I'm done. I don't think we should be treating God's word like that. Um, and sometimes we say, well, I'm busy. And uh, that, that may be the case. Uh, but I believe God's more busy than any one of us. And uh, I know we all have our certain schedules, but we have to ask the Lord. One thing is to pray, Lord, give me that time so that I can better study and grow in your word. I praise God for the Sabbath. Uh, it is the Lord's special day that he set aside for us. That he, went, he set aside a whole day to be with us. Now, if he's, I'm sure he's more busier than us. The vast creation, what he has to, you know, what he's doing and working on the behalves of the hearts of men. And he sets aside an entire day for, for us. And we can't set aside 10, 15 minutes throughout the week each day for him. It kind of, kind of makes you think about things. You know, this is a bloodstained book. Many people have died to preserve the word of God. And it's just like a slap in the face when we just leave it aside. And really, there is no excuse we have. Bibles that read to us, you know, devices, you know, electronics that you have, the Bible apps, and there's really no excuse of not growing in his word. Um, Satan is very busy too. And I believe he's very busy on making us too busy to grow in the Lord. This is the question. Will we allow God to... Uh, to, to, to have us grow in him or are we going to allow Satan to distract us from growing in the Lord? That's the question. Um, and the one thing I did was I prayed. I said, Lord, give me a schedule that I can make to where I can grow in you and grow. In. And he has. Um, it takes some effort, but it says without faith it is impossible to please him. He has rewarded those who diligently seek him. It is a diligent work, but it's going to show that you are really sincere about your faith and your walk in the Lord. <clears throat> in closing speaking about this word an unknown, an unknown writer said this book is the mind of God the state of man the way of salvation the doom of sinners and the happiness of believers its doctrines are holy its precepts are binding its histories are true and its, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Christ is its grand object, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. So how are we treating the word of God? Let's close in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14 and 18. I, I want to read these verses. So. Verses 14 to 18, Peter speaking here. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. And account that long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist, as they do also in other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. 
but grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. If your uh, problem is that you like to, whenever you want to surf the internet, I uh, recommend you put the Bible right there. So that before you surf the internet, you have the word there. If your problem is uh, you like to fiddle with the devices, have the Bible app on you. Read the Bible, have it read it to you. If your problem is eating, just put a Bible right in the refrigerator. Next time you go, if you'll desire to eat something, just, just put it right there next to that orange juice. The object is, what are you doing with the word? Are you really growing in the, in the Lord? And uh, I believe it's very important, especially now. Jesus is coming soon, very soon. And the reason why people rest and twist the scriptures is because they don't have an understanding and they don't accept the truth that it's given in the word to begin with. And we can fall in that same error if we are not diligent to seek him and to have more about Jesus, to learn more about Jesus in his word. So with that, in closing, let us stand and sing our closing.